Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for our opportunity to come together to worship you, to glorify you, and to praise your name. We do ask that your spirit would be present with us as we do these things, that we would be fed and nourished by your word and strengthened for the week to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise and confess our sins using the words of this confession of sin on the screen. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for our sins. We know that we cannot have eternal life without his costly sacrifice. Thank you that he became our sacrificial lamb so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We believe your word, which tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, the Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and help us in all our words, thoughts, and deeds to honor you and your sacrifice that was given for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us. The promise of Scripture is that whoever confesses his sins to the Lord will receive forgiveness through the faithfulness and righteousness of Christ. God grant that this may be the experience of us all. On the other hand, I declare to the impenitent and unbelieving that so long as they continue in their impenitence, God has not forgiven their sins and will assuredly visit their iniquities upon them if they do not turn from their evil ways and come to true repentance and faith in Christ before the day of grace ends. Amen. You may be seated. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, 
he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Let us rise and confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and we pray that in this time, as your word is brought to us, that we would hear it with our open hearts and open minds to be able to receive it as you desire it to be given to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, I counted in our gospel lesson three parables. Uh, I'm only looking at the first one, so I... Um, I'm endeavoring to take out a big chunk of scripture here by doing one entire verse. The parables that we had been looking at in the book of Matthew before this were all pointed at teaching us about the kingdom of heaven, uh, specifically how it is given, uh, given through good seed, right, and how it operates, how that seed grows. And here today, we get to focus more about the kingdom of heaven and how it is acquired, how we um, gain heaven for ourselves. Matthew chapter 13, verses four, uh, verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now we're going to be looking at five points from this verse today. The fact that there is a treasure 
it is hidden. It's in a field. Um, there's something about the finding of this treasure as well as the securing of ownership of this treasure. A um, little point to be made. It was very common in the time back then where if you had wealth or money, you would divide what you had into three parts. And in those three parts, one part of it would be for operating expenses every day, what you needed to be able to conduct your business. Another part would be in the form of precious stones or jewels, and you would use that part of your wealth in case some war broke out somewhere nearby and you needed to flee your land. You would have this little third of your wealth in a nest egg to be able to flee in a hurry if you needed it. And the last third of your wealth you would go and hide somewhere. This might be what you expected to pass on to your next generation. It's really more like an untouchable savings account. And that was a common practice for back then. And when we talk about a man out in a field and he stumbles upon or digs up somehow or another, he discovers a treasure. We're talking about that type of a treasure, which could have been a third of some wealthy person's wealth, um, all in one place. And it would have been common for the people uh, reading this originally to understand that mindset for wealth. Number one, treasure. Uh, treasure must be understood to be comprehensive of all that heaven has to offer. Everything that heaven is. The peace of heaven, the worship that goes on there, the righteousness, the pardon, all of the spiritual pricelessness that could possibly be contained by anything. Heaven, that is the treasure of which we speak. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure, hidden in a field. How hidden is heaven from us? It's an important question to ask. Hopefully, all of us here who are worshiping God today have an understanding of what it took to find heaven for each of us, correct? How did you come to know Jesus? What was the process of that finding? God's treasure is indeed hidden, um, although it is intended to be found by us people. It is not hidden so hard that you can't find it. I like to think of when Annika was young and she wanted to play hide and seek, and she would go off and hide while I counted, and then I could just figure out what room she was in in the house and go stand in the room while she was hiding and it didn't take long before I'd hear her start to giggle. I feel like sometimes this is how God hides his treasure. As soon as you start looking for it, you're going to hear him say, here I am, here I am. Luke chapter 19 verse 42 says, what that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. This idea and concept that heaven is hidden is throughout the scripture. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. And we can put ourselves into the idea of little children there. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Paul speaking here from prison, but declaring the mystery, the idea that these things are hidden from the world, or should I say, hidden from the wisdom of the world. Where is this treasure hidden? It's hidden in a field. And this one might be a little bit harder to make just common sense of for us, but a treasure that is hidden in a field would have been a very common place back then, probably a little less common around Brookings to find a field that you could just go wander around and look in. But this was um, a common uh, understanding, not something that would be surprising for anyone, but you'd be out in a field, and if you found something, then you could go and obtain it. A common place, 
important to understand a common place because it is where common man can find it. You do not need a doctorate degree to go searching in a field. Uh, you do not need the wisdom of men. You do not need the pride of men. Any common person, us, I, can find it in a field. You don't need to be self-sufficient. You don't need to be proud. All of these things apply. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29 says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chooses, chooses the foolish. I love the word foolish in the Greek. Uh, it's, it's moron, morones, uh, moron, where we get our English word from. In the literal meaning, there is nothing between your ears, space between your ears. I heard a joke the other day. Can I tell a blonde joke? Is that too bad for church? How, how do you make a blonde's eyes twinkle? You shine a flashlight in her ear? And, and yeah, that's a bad joke. But it, for the point here, it is exactly what the word moron means in the Greek. Okay? That, that there's, there's, it's somebody who's missing something. How can you be so foolish? Elevator doesn't reach the top floor. All of these types of things would apply to what the Greek is calling God's wisdom. It is not man's wisdom. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This field is also not some random place. If you break down the Greek, it is a, it's, it, there's a definite article there. It's talking about a specific field. Wouldn't that be easy to know the address of which field to go looking for heaven in? You could think of, it'd be like a treasure map from Goonies, right? These kids are going to go finding their treasure. The field is very easily obtained, and it is found right here. This is the field for which the scripture talks about when it describes finding the keys to heaven. The word of God. The field is not some generic random place. It is a specific place. It is the word. It is scripture. John chapter 5 verse 39 says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Jesus is speaking there. They bear witness about Jesus in the scripture. When you go searching, hopefully you will find knock and the door will be opened, seek and you will find, uh, is, is very fitting for this. The finding, the treasure which is hidden in a field is to be found, okay? What are you looking for? John chapter 1 verse 41, uh, the disciples were first getting gathered in the book of John. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, the disciples were so excited to have found the Messiah, the one that the whole world had been looking for in anticipation. Sometimes I feel like today it's hard to find somebody who is looking for God. Back then, the world as people knew it was searching for God. Now, we have a different kind of a story. God can be right in front of all of our noses, right in front of everyone, and people don't have a care to look, seems to be a big problem in the world today. If we go back over some of these points, the idea that the, the treasure is hidden, who did the hiding? God hid this treasure in the field, but he did it in such a way that he could also be the one to be responsible for leading you to it. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. How do you come to Jesus? The Father draws him, you unto Jesus. And the last point, securing ownership. How do you secure ownership of this field? Now, on my 
my personal reading of this verse, sometimes I think, well, what's going on here? The guy stumbles upon a treasure, and then he covers it back up and hides it, and he goes and buys the field and comes back, and, and me and some other people see a little bit of a moral dilemma there. Are, are you... Um, seeking to gain entrance into heaven by trickery, by covering this back up and going off and buying the field. And that is absolutely not the case from uh, the point of the parable. If you read the entire parable, this whole verse, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. The point of the treasure is that the man who buys the field is doing everything right. He is not stealing the treasure. He's not running away with it on his own. He is going through the correct steps in order to purchase the field so that the treasure becomes his own. So there really is no moral dilemma in how he obtains this treasure. It's also interesting to note that the price of the treasure is not so high that he cannot afford it. Let that sink in for just a moment. The price of the treasure is not so high that the man cannot afford it. He sells all that he has and goes and buys the field. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. But whatever I gain, I had, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul, striving to work, to put his all into attaining this resurrection, into receiving this grace. Starting to sound expensive, isn't it? But that's not the point of the parable. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 says, Come, everyone who thirst, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. This very much intentionally alluding to heaven. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, And he said to me, It is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Heaven is free. So in our parable, where the field is purchased, it is very important to understand what is purchased. The field is purchased, not the treasure. You cannot buy heaven. So don't let that fool you in this parable. This man sells all that he has. And this is probably one of my favorite points of this whole one-verse parable. Let this sink in for a minute. If the vessel is empty, then and only then can God's grace fill it. If the man had to go and sell all that he has... If we can get past thinking about his savings accounts and cars and whatever, homes, uh, if, you, if you empty yourself before you come to God, then truly God can begin to use you and work in you and fill you with the blessings that he desires for you. If the vessel is empty, then God's grace can fill it. Christ and the treasures of salvation shut out any and all payment and purchase on our part. But by giving up every self-made human doctrine and philosophy, however deep these may seem to be, we may make the word our own and in and with it all the treasures of salvation. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this verse regarding the field and especially the treasure that it contains. We pray that each one of us can, rem can know you in the same way that this man who had the joy to go off and sell all that he owned in order to acquire this gift. We thank you for the gift that you have given to us and help us to be a light to show the rest of the world that that gift is so easily attainable. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Then we will pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We pray that you especially would be with Ken Knox today as he has been taken up to Sacred Heart in Springfield. We pray that they, as a hospital, uh, would be able to help him in all the best ways possible. We pray that your love would be understood um, through him and uh, that you would be continually reminding him of the peace that he knows that he has through you. I pray that you be with Jane and all of the friends and family as they are supporting him and trying to help him in all the ways that they can. But Lord, we pray that you would um, offer your grace in the midst of this time. We also lift up before you the world around us in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. We pray that as we try to learn how to slow and stop the spread of this uh, sickness, uh, we pray that we could be patient with each other and um, adapt to and adjust to changing the way we're used to living our lives uh, for the sake of health, Lord. Um, we pray that as we do this, we could also do it in such a way that people can see your love through what we do. Uh, I also pray for our nation in the midst of the unrest from what has become known as the Black Lives Matter campaign and Lord, I just pray that there would be understanding into the importance of each individual life, um, but especially, Lord, that uh, the problem that racism is in the world, um, Lord, if we could only share your love in a way that this racism could disappear. Uh, teach us, Lord, teach us how to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. And we continue as he taught us. Let us rise together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And our offering will be received as you exit in the offering box. Thank you very much.